So, this is the regular meeting of the Woodbridge Conservation Commission. Today is May 16th, 2019. And we'll start off with public comments. No one's here for public comment. So we'll move on to the review and uh, approval of minutes from the April 18th meeting. And I'd circulated those around to everybody. That was the meeting when uh, we had Audubon fellows here giving a long talk. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. <laughs> Any discussion about the minutes? All right. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. Next on the agenda is to review the draft rating system score. This is something that we're slowly inching forward on. I'm going to connect up to the projector so we can take a look together at an overview of the draft system as I went through it with all the parcels and then maybe we'll focus in on one or two parcels and dig into the details of what the ratings ultimately added up to. So hopefully technology agrees with me here. I brought my own projector this time. <laughs> That's why it's all the way up here. But yes, it has decided to shrink itself. Can't go too far back, otherwise it get chopped off the top. But that should work out. Sit here, you want to sit here? Nice. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, using our rating system that we've been toiling away on, <laughs> I went through and rated these 18 parcels and came up with these scores. And then I highlighted is this is almost arbitrary in terms of how I broke it up, but I felt like it seemed to, since we've got three tiers of criteria, it seemed as though let's kind of break things into three groupings. So at the top, we had these parcels rating 180 and above, and then we had these parcels rating 150 and above, and then the remaining ones below that. Now, just as a review, the whole point of this was to have an objective scale combined with a subjective rating as well. So what we're looking at right now is just the objective scale. It's meant to be joined with, and I had uh, one of these over here. So for every parcel, I'd like us to put together a rating that has multiple he headings. So we got the objective section, which is what we're going to be talking about right now. But then there's the whole subjective part to it. And also um, maps. So we've set some visuals. Um, in this one, this is, um, this is 57 Park Lane. I've looked at it enough so I can know just by the shape of it. Um, it's that parcel right there. So it's one of the higher ranked ones. If you're not familiar familiar with it, it's over on the side of town by Stop and Shop. It actually oh, is the slope up above Stop and Shop and looks down. Um, there's a lot of state and town-owned property around it, so it ranks fairly high on that particular measure. Um, it's kind of hard to see this on the overhead right now. There's a red outline of the parcel here. Pretty much all wooded. Uh, then we get into any wetland soils. It's a little wet right near the road. This is Park Lane, the road itself. And if you've walked this, you know, as soon as you get onto the trail that's in this area, it's kind of squishy. Uh, farmland soils, there are none on there. Uh, and topographical, you know, the back half of this parcel just gets very steep. Very, very steep. So this was the objective uh, sheet that was 
I've put together. So we have our primary, secondary, and tertiary criteria. And I went through each of these. Now we had clearly defined what each of these would be, and high rating down to very low rating, or desirable down to undesirable. So um, desirable by well, it determined to conserve or to on the rating. Invest. Just just as an example of um, desirable or not desirable on-site buildings. Mm -hmm. If there's many on-site buildings, it's less desirable. But if there are fewer on or no on-site buildings, it's more desirable. Um, and we've got the t other sheet behind it here that gives us all of our clear definitions for each of the, the ratings. So starting at the top, the use of property. If we go to our all criteria, use of property. I had ranked it at a four, meaning it's primarily in natural state over 50%. And what's a, one out of ten for each one? Uh, it's so there's five scores, zero to four. Uh huh. And then depending upon which <coughs> group you're in, the primary criteria have a greater weight. So if you were high, you'd get a forty on this particular one. If you were in the secondary criteria and you scored a one over here, you get a twenty. And then tertiary is a ten. So there's a weighted scale to it all as well. So Park Lane is primarily still all forested. There's no development on it. It's all um, in natural state. This rating is one that I still struggle with, that I, I would like to have, I think I would almost like to have a site meeting and to look at what, what the definition of habitat of conservation concern is. Um, We've got a reference to it. It re uh, reaches back to the Connecticut Deep publication. Um, I won't get into it here, but it's just one of those ratings that it's you can't just sit and look at a map and figure it out. I think it needs a site visit. So it um, doesn't have any score for all of the parcels. I did not score the habitat. Um, Site restrictions, whether there's any restrictions on the parcel. Can of I any kind. You for one second? Yeah. I'm so sorry. When I was looking up the grants, yeah. for um, the DEEP grant, their list of criteria mm -hmm. goes with that habitat of conservation concern. Yeah, they've got it in there. Is yeah, habitat. About species yep, for native plant or animal, animal species listed as threatened, relatively undisturbed, example of native ecological community, which is uncommon I that so that's good for us yeah I mean for conservation yeah it's I, and I think that's why we grouped it up there it's just okay. we were having a hard time right I right right I know what you mean clarifying it to ourselves in terms of putting it into the scoring system okay, okay. Um, proximity to existing preserved lands uh, 57 park lane scored well because it is adjacent to town and land trust properties so that's actually, I had a really wonderful like two hour conversation with Eric Bars from Windsor. Yep. And he was, one of the things he brought up is how many issues were, um, or rating things had, you know, a very strong per, uh, point and then had an opposing, a flip coin side to it, right? And one of the things he mentioned was proximity of other open lands yeah. and that that wasn't necessarily a good thing as in other words because and we I've always thought yeah of course it, the more open land you have together the contiguous the better and he was saying no in fact in terms of land use sometimes it's much better to contain those areas that you're using and use those other areas for development now Windsor is you know a town um, three times the size of Woodbridge, and they have a town planner, they have an environmental planner, and they have an assistant town planner full time, right? But, and they also, every other year, approve a million and a half square feet of development, right? So, uh, but the point yeah. he was making is that you, uh, you, you said you can't forget you need development too. He said, you know, and, 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 the, and so, and so that was his point, in other yeah. words that 
necessarily because it's contiguous, it might not be a number one. It might be that the land use is more important, say, for if it was, you know, say, in an area that the town determined was for development, say, in the, in the uh, you know, the uh, flats or something, as I know we, mm -hmm. some people like and some people don't like that term, but then it would not be as high a, a category. So he said in, in one of the things they were looking at is how do they do that? How do they have a, how do they have a rating that sort of is on the other side of that? I think, but on the positive side, you have that corridor if, if you have it next to other land for wildlife and whatnot, you know, on the yeah. positive side of that. And that's corridor. always, that's always. Well, I think that, argument. well, that's, it surprised me because my assumption was always, yes, of course, contiguous would be very important, but he's saying, mm -hmm. well, there's another side of that. Yeah, it depends yeah. on what it is, I mean, right? Yeah. Depends on what it is. I yeah, that's yeah. Not, that's I see both something ways. that you could develop, right? Well, and so his point was, they were trying to figure out in, in their their matrix, how do we have a, a, a rating that offsets, maybe contiguous, where you would say um, that the uh, highest and best use of that property was more valuable to the town for another reason that wasn't conservation. Mm -hmm. I would like to see the objective scales balanced with the subjective, and I think that's what you're talking about yeah. is mm. while this can, and the whole point of the objective is this, you can see on a plot map that here's this parcel and it's got three abutting parcels and they're all land trust, so it would rate very high here, but maybe it's a really large parcel and you might want to carve out part of it for development of some kind. And that could be f kind of detailed out in the subjective part and it would balance it. Yeah, I think but yeah, that's I, where you put it in. So. And, and how, to, how to weight that is something that I think we're going to have to And again, talk about. And he was also saying in the conservation develop, development plan, you know, what is, how is that land, is there another plan for that land in the conservation and development plan? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, like future, let's say it was a future space for um, a, land, a landfill or a, you know, another, right? right? Or baseball fields, or you know. Yeah, and that's something I would love to have in uh, this part of the document where we talk about the whole subjective pieces, um, walking it and talking about. Well, this I just thrown in there because I've walked on that parcel, but the whole subjective section could be fleshed out in much greater detail about current use, future use, adjacent parcels that already fill the need of open space that this one might not need that um, need that criteria rated highly. Uh, threat to cultural or historical resources. Um, again, going back to our definitions. Um, if there was a if, if there was a me an immediate threat, meaning approved development that would rate very high, but if in the terms of Park Lane there's no immediate development proposed, um, so it scored a low. Uh, existing trails, there are existing trails on this particular parcel, and uh, early successional habitat. A good example of that is um, the fields in uh, Alice Newton Street Park, where things had been cleared but now everything's coming back. Mm -hmm. Park Lane is forest. Mm -hmm. The trees have clearly been there for mm -hmm. 30, 40 years now. And then totaling up each column down here. And then we move on to our secondary criteria where we talk about the size of the property. We've got a very clear indicator here. More than 50 acres, 25 to 49. And it goes on down from there. Uh, Park Lane gets a score of one. So interestingly enough, here he, he had also mentioned in this category exactly what you've come up with there, yeah. is that in their piece they do not rate size of property, which he found was probably not good because, you know, he called it uh, conservation measles, where all mm -hmm. of a sudden you have like, you know, a hundred different teeny little pieces of uh, property right. which rate highly, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he, he also said that they chose not to have a, but he said if you did it, he would say, suggest doing it this way. 
but they allowed the rest of their criteria to, they, they didn't put that in the matrix. Yeah. It's interesting, you know. It is. And I, I agree, you don't want to end up with four acre, 24 acre parcels spread all over the town. I thought conservation measles was a good idea. Conservation measles. <laughs> um, nearby development, we had changed this one. Um, it had been development pressure, I think is what the title was. And that led to some confusion, meaning is there, does that mean there's an immediate development happening? So just by changing the title, I was hoping to clarify it, to call it nearby development, because the score talks about adjacent parcels and what's on the adjacent parcels. And in the draft that we have here, we're indicating if there's no structures on adjacent parcels, that's desirable. The more development on adjacent parcels, the less desirable. Uh, but again, that could be something that is offset by a subjective review. Because mm -hmm. if we're talking about a parcel that's 40 acres, it's probably going to have development all around it. But it's such a large piece that does it, should it have that level of impact. Uh, plants and animals, this one is fairly cut and dry. It talks about protected plants and animals on the... Uh, whether they're endangered or threatened or of local interest. Um, and I was going based upon what Connecticut Deep had out there. Uh, again, this might uh, be affected by local knowledge mm -hmm. as to what's actually on the parcel. Um, cultural and historical resources. So this area of town does have Native American trails so it was given a little bit, um, where was this one? Rated at some local or historical interest. Mm -hmm. um, the next step up makes you eligible for a national or state register. So it's a big jump from mm -hmm. yeah. local interest to being eligible for. Yeah, being unless you register. found the graveyard. Right, found the Indian graveyard and proof mm -hmm. that it's there. Uh, potential for one or more trails, absolutely, right. and in fact there already are a few on it. Um, on-site buildings, in this one there's no on-site buildings, so it hits this mark. And why doesn't it hit like a zero? Uh, so this is the one that's a little odd, because if there were no on-site buildings it would be more desirable, but if you have buildings that means maintenance and liabilities, so you oh, don't want it. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's that's one that you got to flip your mindset it's a around a little bit. It's a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. yeah. And then we get down to the tertiary criteria: um, access. How accessible is the parcel? Is there any immediate access to it? And this one does have immediate access. There's parking right there. Um, outdoor rec um, needs. So. On all of the parcels, this is sort of a squishy one as well, kind of like the habitat, because I think we need to spend a little more time talking with Rec about what their current needs and plans are. You know, we had presentations from Rec two, three, four years ago, and uh, I think it would be worthwhile meeting with them to see what their current plans are and desires. Uh, farm well, trails are recreation. I mean, it, it, they there are. are trails on there. I mean, yep, and that's passive it, recreation or whatever you want. Yeah, and that's why I had given this one a small, right. a small score. Uh, and here is our farming. There's no farming on the parcel, and if you've ever looked at it, you'd be hard pressed to figure out how you'd squeeze a farm onto it. Um, it's all ledge. Uh, the riparian forest buffer. <clears throat> this gets to streams and uh, vernal pools and whatnot. This one's got very minimal on the parcel. So it had a rating of no riparian buffer, although mm -hmm. I think we could probably argue based upon the, oh, the map with the wetlands, which this one's got. No, it doesn't show it. Right on this corner. Mm -hmm. So we might... Yes, drain there, coming into it. Um, 
Right on the corner. Yeah. It's Is it's chain coming into it from another pond or something up above. It yes, from the neighboring parcel from okay. here. Yeah, it it yeah, flows yeah, down. Yep, yeah, yeah, there. There's a stream there. Yeah, because right in this area, it's very wet, and I think it's a almost a vernal pool. I think it might dry up quite a bit late summer. Of course, we've had so much rain. So much rain. A lot of vernal pools. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then forest cover. This is based upon looking at the aerial map of the parcel. Uh, the town mapping tools, the town GIS uh, website, allows you to actually draw out polygons and it'll compute the area inside of whatever you draw out. So I took the, and this is what I've done for all the parcels, I've taken the entire parcel, and this one's eight and a half acres, and then I would go around and draw around the forested area and it would tell me how much acreage was inside that forested area. And in this case, I mean, just visually you can see it's, mm -hmm. it's all forest on this one. And then wetlands, again, using the tool on the GIS site to outline wetlands, I had computed 0.37 acres. Now, it might seem exact, but I'm working with rough tools online so mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't use that figure as gospel I mean it's it's something that if we needed to do a very serious study that's a very rough guess to work from and then the totals for tertiary so adding up all of the scores we get to 182.5 now do we have something or is that in subject uh, one of the big things Windsor does is the constraints, right? So and I didn't understand. Did you get an explanation yeah, of what constraint so factor is? What the is? constraints are is that uh, under the current re zoning regulations for development, so let's say if it's in an A1 zone, you have to have X number of acres and you have to be able to get so many driveways in or, you know, in other words, and so they would say based on the development potential. So there's some properties that have zero development potential because of the, set, for instance, on this property, where that steep land, it's actually by code not developable, right? Mm -hmm. And so because it's constrained by zoning and building regulations, then they give it less high rating because it's not as necessary for them to protect it. That's the yeah. concept that makes sense. Yeah. All right. And that's, that's so I actually thought that was a pretty cool. Yeah, it is. That makes a lot of sense. A constraint factor. Yeah. That, that and of course, if you have a town exactly. planner and two assistants, it's a little easier to figure. That out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they've rated every single parcel in their town. I yeah. Think. Yeah. It, it was a very long matrix that they put together, so that makes more sense now. Sure. So, in other words. As example, something that was imminently developable and had access it. from and a lot of road frontage would be something that would be a, a real threat for development, right? In other words, because it's a prime, you know, not that you anything against, a, a, you know, a high density development or affordable housing or anything like that. But if it's if the economic return is very high. And the property is easily developable, then it would have a higher rating in terms of the, uh, the conservation wanting to protect it. So this was the mm -hmm. Windsor mm -hmm. spreadsheet. And can I take a second, maybe, to help because I didn't get this at all when I first saw it. <laughs> yes. But yes. The 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 color coding. Uh, if you on the left hand side, the totals in the yellow, the yeah. purple, the blue, are then all broken down in the other sections. So, so, so for instance, so this total yellow. weight contiguous has several different ratings on, on the contiguous land and how it rates. And then they have, um, you'll see again, we t I talked about constraint down there. They have a separate sheet at the bottom that is a constraint analysis, and then sheet one <laughs> is a rating of the, the each property based on these criteria that are above. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so the highest rating you can get is the uh, property you want to protect the most. So if you have a hundred percent constraint, it means that's what you that you want. To protect. So in that we looked at that one piece, and a hundred percent constrained is it's unbuildable. So it has a very low rating for protection. Because it's a since it's kind of protected anyway, it's in its own right, way. Right, by regulation and zoning yeah, and building, yeah. it's, it's already protected. It's the yeah. And that's always a, a topic that comes up over and over, is if, we're, if the town is interested in pursuing acquisition of a parcel, why? Is, right. is it something that just by virtue of its geography you can't, the owner can't do anything with it, so the town maybe should not put a lot of effort into going after it. Or, for instance, as he said, you know, where they are, you know, they have very tight wetlands regulations. So if the entire parcel is wetland, then the constraint would be very high. And again, access, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in other words, even the one we're looking at now that uh, you, that across from the West River, that you can't have access to the other side of mm. that property, then that would lower, you know, put a higher constraint. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's the one I was thinking of because on our matrix, that parcel, which is 1875 Litchfield Turnpike, on our objective rating, it ranks up to the top. But as Leo was just mentioning, if we considered Building constraints, development constraints. Uh, it's a tough one to work with. So, perhaps its overall score would be dropped lower because of a constraint factor. I like that. Now that it's been explained, yeah. Now that we understand it, yeah. <laughs> last that, last consider. month we didn't know. Well, it. when especially when we have as limited dollars as we do, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Constraint analysis. Mm -hmm. I'm going to zoom in on this one over here. Uh, so they've gotten pretty detailed. Very detailed. Yes. Yeah. I'm just shrinking these up so we can see these. So these are the factors that they consider while de determining a constraint factor. Huh? Floodplains, steep slopes. Yep. Acreage and steep slopes, wetlands. wetlands, percent wetlands, and then you get percent constraint. Well, and he what he said they have not worked as well with is some of the zoning restrictions, and he was familiar with Woodbridge, and he said because of our, uh, I think it's ten year old now, um, requirement for. Uh, to it, the square you have to place on the building lot to be able to make it a building lot. Oh, right. In, in terms of the percentage of uh, dry land you have to have. Yeah. So that's another thing, but that would take a lot of calculation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would. But we wouldn't have to rate all of the parcels, I suppose. Right. If we, if we had. Um, Desire, we could just go through the 18 that I had put up here. And mm -hmm. these 18 came from our open space plan. Right. These are the parcels that were of interest of acquisition going back to the 2003 plan and back further from there as well. All right. Well, coming back around to our current rating scale, our draft scale, um, how's everyone just generally feeling about it? I haven't heard anyone say it's horrible. I'm frankly amazed at how much work you guys have done. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking going back to your thought in terms of when I first came on is to select maybe a prop, you know, five properties and have all of us do the same rating system that you went through mm -hmm. and see if, how close our objective ratings come up. Right. If anyone would like to, I can I can show you what. Well, I I've think done if you you know these so well, if you selected five that you thought were, um, you know, like select one that you thought would have rated very differently than how it came out. Mm -hmm. Select another one that you're absolutely confident that everybody, you know, maybe just five properties, and if each one of us did it on our own, mm -hmm. and just see where it came out. Yeah. 
That'd be an interesting. <laughs> as long as if, as long as the, there's willing people to do it, I'm happy to instruct and, and guide you through the well, steps. This is that really I important. Do, so, and come with us. <laughs> I'll come to your house with my computer and I'll sit there. No, that that'll that'll skew the result. That'll no, but don't you don't you have you have to walk it? No, for this. Oh, you didn't walk it. I sat at home on the computer and used the GIS town map system oh, I you walked to produce the uh, the maps that are in this document. These all come. From, these are just screenshots that I put together from the GIS system. We could do that. We could do that. But I would also like to take. A completed one by you, and do the sub. We need to the do the subjective. subjective. Yeah, yes. I want to do that. Yeah. Too. Can we do that together? Is that legal or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would. It would just be. Yeah. 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 Um, the the, the tricky part interesting. is that um, these are all privately owned parcels, so. Oh right. Can't get. We, can't we have access to them. Right? We, we if, I mean, we could ask for Permission. access. Right. For for a meeting. Right. Um, 57 Park Lane is one that's easy to get to. It's also not huge in terms of uh, um, acreage. 10 Warren Road is another one that we could kind of do because all it is is Knoll's Pond. It, it is quite seriously the pond. <laughs> but 10 Warren Road, when you say it's the pond, yeah. Did, uh, we do they that? have all those pieces of the property la lines, actually the property rights go well into the middle of the pond. It's yeah, like, you got it. Yeah. Right. Here, you know, put up the aerial. It's a little harder to see because of the washout, but the red line is the boundary of oh. the property. So 10 Warren is just not the property. It, it, it's pretty much the pond uh -huh. and the wetlands there on it. I mean, you can't really walk it unless you've got a snorkel. Well, it's yeah. not buildable for one thing. So it is. Right, it is not buildable. Yeah, and this is one parcel that I've always wondered, what, why why are these carved out chunks into the parcel? Like, I think one of them is owned by the state of Connecticut, one of them is owned by the town of Woodbridge. Oh. It, it's bizarre. I'm sure there's some history behind it. And that would go into the subjective rating. <laughs> well, some of what I've heard in, in the history of this area is that was originally, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was started out as a camp, basically, for, and it was mostly an Italian camp, and that the pond was much smaller. Oh. And so that may have something to do with that. that and, and people's attitudes about development were much different at that point. <laughs> Uh, yeah. In terms of filling, you know. Yeah, and once, and pond, I've, I've once, heard pond, rumors about once pond lily came up, yeah. that dammed it up. And anyway, we digress. So I just noticed that those are all. Oh, yeah, yeah Canals Pond was created by a uh, an ice pond at at first in the 18, 1900s, right? So so it probably wasn't a pond at one time at all. Yeah. So it had these small chunks that, and then, and that, then that used to be land and now they're not. And yeah, they're, on the books possible. they were still land. Yeah. And maybe the current owner gave up pieces just to get a little tax abatement. So I'm pretty sure taxes aren't so high on a uh, piece of water. Um, all right. Any other thoughts on the draft rating system we've got put together so far? I think we should try to find a way to get the early, uh, early uh, habitat in there. Successional habitat. Yeah, this one. I think we should do something. Our habitat of conservation concern. All right. So we'll focus on clearing that up on this one. Yeah. Um, work to get a little more info from REC about what they're current projects are. What and I think may take a little of the Windsor thing and look at all the breakouts for contiguous. Uh -huh. Maybe have more definitions on that. Um, all right. Well, if there's no other thoughts on this, I want to move, okay. move the meeting along. Okay. I'll shut off the projector. <laughs> Oh.
Oh, there was another thing Windsor had was, uh, I don't know if we have it here, it was something about a threat, but they said it, if, if it's actually listed on the market, mm. they gave it a, a, a import rating, yeah. in which that you need to pay attention. And that was something that I, I think we had talked about it, and we're on the fence as to whether or not to put that in there, just because it's on the market today, but the owner might pull it, and I can, uh, 57 Park Lane is a good example. It was on the market for a while, and now it's been off the market for four years. So does that mean every time it comes on and off the market, we have to go back to the rating system and keep changing it every time? It was because it's so such a temporal thing. Well, and here's the other thing is, I remember a lot of discussion with the conservation development, uh, doing the conservation development before this last one, is whether to list the top 10 properties you wanted to conserve because in most cases they were a lot of acreage and they were developable, right? Could be developable, you know, and yeah. so they, people said, do you really want to advertise this? Mm. Yep, that's always the, the flip, the, the opposite side of the coin on that. You want to be interested, but do you want to be that transparent? All right, so next on the agenda is to go over our 2019 open space plan draft. Can I ask you one other question? Do we have watershed? Is uh, that part of riparian or wetland? The, as a category. Well, in terms of watershed, I think it might fall under wetlands and riparian. Okay. When I think of watershed, I think of a standing body riparian of water. And buffers and then the other one is... Uh, you have the historical there, yep. and Ridgefield, for instance, has a historical resource inventory, which they then uh, fold into their conservation plan. But they actually go around, they list um, the you know Charter Oak Tree, uh, mm. the uh, Litchfield Stone Wall. Or the, you know, in other words, they list all these specific, like the the um, the the kilns, right? Right. But they, but they actually have a list of all of these, so you can cross-reference it when you're coming up with that. That would be very helpful, because on that those particular items about the um, cultural and historical resources. Yeah. I'm going based upon what I know from only being in town for 15 years and on the um, historical society board, but that that doesn't even scratch the surface of the history in the town. So, yeah, I think having that as an inventory of sorts would be very helpful in this. How could we find that? Well, my first inclination would, go, would be to go to the Historical Society yeah. and say, what do you guys know? Yeah. <laughs> and check with Simon and yeah, Simon knows yeah, everything on like that side of town. Historian. Yeah, he knows a lot about that. Yeah, that's, just ask him to make the list. <laughs> yeah, we should. We really should. Yeah, yeah he'll, he'll come up with something. All right, on our okay. draft open space plan for 2019, we were going to do some updates. Uh, Julie, you were going to look at zoning and ordinance. Yeah. Did you get a chance to yeah. dig into that? Okay. Uh, I, likewise, have not come up with a natural resource inventory. Lauren, have you made headway on... The well, funding sources? I looked at um, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Deep Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program. Yep. And that is due February 2020. Is that what I was supposed to find out? The dates then it's due? Yes, for, for all of the ones that we've got in our open space plan. Just go through the... Did I not do the right thing? Oh, you've done one of them. Okay. I think if you go into the open <laughs> space plan... Uh -huh. There's a section on funding. Yes, right. And I think there's, I want to say, eight or ten. Okay, so I have that one. That's February 2020. Another one, the National Park Service one is August 1st. I can write them down. Yes. Okay. The, what? As to what you're working on? Yeah. I had it on a piece of paper and then I typed it into the computer. So it's not on the minutes? Uh, it's on the... February minutes. Because I couldn't open the February minutes. I think that's what it was. Okay. Okay. I gotta get them from you again. Um, that was my job. 
<laughs> <laughs> Your job revolved around wetlands, I think. Uh, let me go back to the minutes, because I don't remember off the top of my head. February minutes. Let's see here. Leland, oh, you were going to look at the funding as well. You are going to see if there was additional funding. I think we were talking about, um, at that point, we were talking about agriculture a yes. bit. Yes. And you were going to see if you were able to come up with some additional funding sources to add to the open space plan. I have a list. I didn't bring it. All right. But I actually did that part of the homework. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so afraid I didn't do my homework. <laughs> I dog ate mine. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, pressure's on for the June meeting. Let's all bring our stuff. I, I think we're... You want, didn't I have another homework piece? I, uh, no. Oh, you were going to look at um, the relevant content around Baldwin Drive. In the open space plan, there's a description about Baldwin Drive, uh -huh. and you had some good additional verbiage to add to it. You remind me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what it was. I'd have to go back and, and, but it, and it watch it. It was to take game. Baldwin Drive and to see how it fit. No, it was just literally to adjust the description of that particular parcel because you, oh, were, you okay. were working closely with it. Oh, I know right. It. Uh, yeah, because each of these parcels in the open space plan have got a fairly yes. loose definition right. and, and description, and I would love to see them Thank you. filled out a bit. Although Baldwin Drive is one that should be coming off the list of properties right. of acquisition because it should be getting saved soon. All right, so we'll continue our talk about the open space plan at our June meeting. Next on the agenda. And this is probably a joint thing for me and Betsy uh, to discuss trails and trail maintenance in town. Uh, we, Betsy and I have met twice now with members of the Woodbridge Land Trust and the Woodbridge Parks Association, and we are working towards drafting a trail maintenance guidebook. And the intent is to have a collaborative document that encompasses all the trails in town and sets forth guidelines and standards that we want to adhere to so that when you're on a Parks Association trail here at Alice Newton Street and then you wander off into Eldersley, the signage look the same, the trailblazers are the same, it's maintained with the same level of care across the board. Um, what else are we... I think that's the, 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 the focus right now. A level of consistency because the end user doesn't know and doesn't care whose property they're on. They just right. want to enjoy the trail and a lot of our trails cross um, property lines and the user shouldn't notice, oh, all of a sudden this is different. You know, it should there should be some continuity. There. Right. This blaze is dark blue over there and over here it's light blue. Is that Yeah, have I wandered off that, the trail? Is that a different trail? Am I still going where I belong? Um, so we're continuing to have those meetings. In June, we'll have another follow-up, and I think, I'm hoping, by that point, maybe we can have a draft guidebook that we can yeah. circulate around to everybody. Right now, it's... It's pretty rough. It's random notes, <laughs> sort of stream of consciousness in some ways. So before giving a draft out to everybody for a perusal, we'll tighten it up a bit. But that's something that... Um, actually, I think our next meeting with the, the trails comes before the... Um, conservation meeting so maybe yeah. we will have something by then any questions all good all right um, next to last is the update on the 2019 trail walks I am still working with the folks up at Masaro to do uh, a trail walk on June 1st or 2nd to, co uh, to coordinate with the Connecticut Trails Day um, I'm still waiting to hear back to see whether or not we have a speaker that could talk about hunting and gathering and foraging while walking on the trail behind Masaro. I know we've got Farmer Steve that can talk 
for days about the the agriculture on the properties and that's what he will do uh, i'm hoping so that one is definitely in the books um, any other thoughts on trails or or i know we were talking about maybe reaching out to andrea urbano to talk about her uh, forestry expertise in terms of a trail walk and talking about the trees or uh, ornithology or geology from i don't you so had a lead. Jay Agu yep. at Yale agreed to he do something in September or October, oh, so I can reconnect with him. Yep. So if we can nail down a date on yep. that one, that we can firm up. Is there a date we would like him to hit? Honestly, no. <laughs> I think in the past we had done every every month we were trying for the first weekend in the month, but I think we've gone off that rail at this point where we we're no longer doing the monthly trail walks so i don't think there's any reason to stick with the first weekend of every month i think it'll be availability of the the special guest and announce it and publicize it as much as we can to draw draw people to it september october is usually good because it's cool enough before it gets cold right i yep. would think yep unless there's a hurricane but yes <laughs> unless it, of course <laughs> Always a can of it. All right. No other thoughts about trail walks? All right. Um, chairman's report. Two things. Um, one, and I'll thank uh, Pua for this, and I circulated some info just today about a bottle bill at the state level talking about recycling. Uh, I thought I was pretty good and up on the current trends in terms of recycling, but apparently I'm not. Um, uh, apparently China was accepting lots of our recycling waste and no longer so now all of that recycling waste is sitting back stateside and it's affecting budgets across Connecticut as well as across the nation so just something that I wanted to make members aware of I'm not sure there's something that Conservation Commission has something to act on right now but put your thinking caps on and if there's something that you'd like to do, promote um, certainly contact your, our local legislators, uh, whether you support or don't support the change in the bottle bill. I, you brought up the National Geographic article, which is yeah. you know fascinating about all the breakdown of plastics and stuff like that. But I think it's absolutely something as a commission that we should be recommending to the Board of Selectmen you know, something to do with plastics and recycling and this whole movement, which is right on the verge, right? I think we should get behind it and we should make a recommendation. That's what... I think we are behind it and we are, because when I go to the publicly owned property meeting... Coupop? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I We talked about it because they said now um, the transfer station, now they're charging... Uh, for uh, us. Yeah. They're yeah, putting in a scale. Right. they're putting in a scale, but that's for demolition waste. That's not for household trash. I did because I I went to the, mm -hmm. the dump last weekend, and I'm like, what's that? Right. Um, yeah, well, that, yeah, that's for the commercial they still, people. You know, bottled water, giant machines of bottled water, and these kids learn in grammar school that they're that they shouldn't be drinking out of. Uh, but I get in my son's car. There's, you know, there's bottles of water there, all over. The there's place. none of these. No. In there. <laughs> And they claim our, 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 our WA water is better than the bottled water. Yeah. And so, and they have these machines in the schools on. now where if you bring one of those, you can fill it up. And I say to the kids, if you have to get a plastic bottle, fill it up with the water there. They don't do it because they have the, the machines, you know, the big um, vending machines in school. I think that's a big, that would be a good... Mm -hmm. You know, what could we do to... I, I and couldn't all, agree with you more. Yeah, it's just... Yes. It's a lazy habit. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Well, and it's relatively new. The whole thing is a shame that it even started. But also, um, the other piece was um, there's another committee that... What, Sustainability? Thank you. Yes, that's the one. There is? Yes. In town? Yes. Yes. Yes, well, the town has a sustainability. Yes. So and this I is learned, something they're really Yes, it's on. huge. And so we already they're are. On, so do not the worry. We're already okay, yeah, on it, and we are trying. And we're not saying it's fixed, but we, we it's already it's going. Okay. And there's actually a lot going on statewide. Yes. So locally, the town, there's not a lot that we can do independent of other towns because our trash and our recycling all goes to a regional center. 
and the regional center sets the rates that we pay and decides what can be recycled and what can't be recycled. So a lot of it is out of our hands. The education piece is what we have control over. And because, as you mentioned, a lot, a lot of this is, is changing, the regional centers are working to kind of figure out what to do and how to do it. And once that all shakes out, then we'll know what we can start educating people on. But right now it's all in flux. Um, and so part of the frustration I think that sustainability is dealing with is that people are having this conversation. Well, what, what do we do? How do we fix this? And we don't have the answers yet because we're waiting on other people to tell us. And then we can start saying, you know, this is recyclable, this is not recyclable, or this is how you recycle this thing. But right now it's all up in the air. So that's, I think that's contributing to a lot of the frustration. But I, I agree with Leland that, I mean, I'm... I told them that we're already on I'm in board, favor of it. So I, I feel like I need to learn a bit more. Hoopop and so, sustainability well, things conservation's on board. Just FYI, that's my fault. I told them that we are on board. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you are not wrong. <laughs> 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 on a somewhat related note, on June 1, the town is organizing um, multiple events over at the town center. So the library book sale will be going on. The garden club plant sale will be going on. The Dog Park Cooperative is hosting a Mutt Strut fundraiser, and our Red Litter Day, which was originally scheduled for late April but we got rained out, has been rescheduled to happen on June 1 in the morning at approximately the same time as these other events. And that it, the goal of Red Litter is to get people to try and pick up roadside litter around town to pick, you know, to beautify the town. What's it um, called? Red, Red litter. litter Day. Uh -huh. And so, if people are able to stop by between 11 and 1 on June 1, we'll have maps of the town with highlighted areas that need a little TLC and trash bags and people can pick up um, trash, give us a rough estimate of where they think they'll leave the bag and Public Works will pick up the bags the following, uh, early the following week. We'll also have information about, um, probably information about the scale coming in and we had hoped to have information about recycling to tell people, but we're not there yet. Not there yet. So stay tuned. Yes. As soon as we know, we'll start telling people, but we're waiting. But in the meantime, educate yourselves on the, at least the legislation that's going up at the state level. Um, and if you feel moved, get out there and nudge our legislatures. Uh, and the other thing on the chairman's report that came to my attention recently um, is that agriculture at the Darling House. You know, we've had the, the farm over there at the Darling House for the last few years. It was started with Aaron Taylor. Uh, Ethan's now picked it up. Um, and I guess there is now some changes happening over there around um, agriculture. It looks as though it's not ending, but there's some changes. And since the Conservation Commission is tasked with agriculture-related things in town, uh, and this is town-owned property, the Darling property, um, I... I think it might be appropriate for us to have a discussion about it. Not tonight. I think we're kind of bumping at the end of time. But also I want to get a little more information uh, about it. But just wanted to make everybody aware that that side of town agriculture is... Discussions are happening. I don't think, like I said, I don't think it's ending or anything like that. But there's changes afoot. So. Anything happening with the, with the Shepherd's Farm? Anything changing there? I have you know not that I know of. Not that, I'm pretty sure Sarah's not doing any farming over there. There's a hoop house that has a tractor parked in it. Um, but yeah, that's another one that would be really great if it was able to be brought back in some way. So that's all I've got for news to report to everybody. Is there a motion to adjourn? Nobody? Really? I just say I say I was so I can't believe how of the matrix because I didn't I had no idea till today because I hadn't seen all the back <laughs> things I want you guys <laughs> it's all there yeah I will make a motion that we adjourn I'll I'll second. Second. any discussion of course not thank you Good. all in favor thank you everybody all right. thank you